sisters, get ready to experience the Unity Shabbat Kum, a celebration of praise and glory to the Most High Yah, hosted by Congregation Beit DCB. Join us on May 25th, 2024 at Shell's Loft, Brooklyn, located at 120 Hamilton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11231. This event promises a day filled with spiritual upliftment, community unity, and joyful fellowship. Come together with fellow brothers and sisters to honor and worship as we celebrate the divine presence in our lives. For more information and to reserve your spot, contact us at 347-622-9090 or email us at info at baydcb.org. Don't miss this opportunity to connect, rejoice, and experience the power of unity and faith. Once again, brothers and sisters, experience the beauty of unity and faith at Unity Shabbat Kum. Presented by Congregation Bay DCB. Join us on May 25th, 2024 at Shell's Laws, Brooklyn. Located at 120 Hamilton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. 11231. This special day is dedicated to praising the Most High Yah and coming together as a community and worship and celebration. Whether you're seeking spiritual enlightenment or simply looking to connect with like-minded individuals, this event offers an uplifting experience for all. Reserve your spot today by contacting us at 347-622-9090 or emailing us at info at Let's gather in unity and embrace the spirit of togetherness as we honor the divine presence in our lives. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom. By the rivers of Babylon, yeah, we sat down and we cried. When we remembered Jerusalem, we were sick, Lord, near to dying. Oh. Yeah. Shalom, shalom, family. Welcome to another um, Tanakh review. My name is Uzi Alewi, one of the teachers of Congregation Beit Da'ak Hak Mavina, located in the Red Hook section of Brooklyn, New York. Thanking you all once again for joining us. First and foremost, giving all glory to the Most High, King of the Universe, Jehovah Zavahot, for life, food, clothing, and shelter, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. I pray and I hope that the Creator will continue to be with us, guide us, and protect us, that He will watch over us and even um, keep us in the right frame of mind because mental health is very important. So um, today we will be reviewing the um, the Sidra portion of Sal um, and Proverbs 25. And... Um, we um I pass it on to one of my teachers and one of my mentors even um Nasik Sarishad I've been Yehuda. How are you, Nasik? Uh great. Uh, first of all I'd like to praise the Supreme Town Universe coming out for Father Scott Abraham House and Jacob to respect your platform more on D C B channel platform, uh spiritually a chief prince area up in Sasko, to the host chief Uzael, to um the Princess Chief, uh Corny, uh Rabinet, uh Maureen Brothers and sisters and visitors, I greet you all on the tongue of my forefathers, Shalom Aleichem, and uh, early Shabbat Shalom. And I like to always start off as Adonai Septai Ditaku Pia Gitia Theaka, O Lord, Om Dhamma Lips, and my mouth shall declare that praise. First, I'd like to um, just say that we're in the book of Leviticus, and then uh, the portion that we're going to be um, the word Zaw. Zaw is uh, actually a command, you know, an imperative command. And it starts in the sixth chapter and ends at the eighth, eighth chapter. But um, before I, I talk on that, um, I'd like to bring out some things in Wayikra, and um, which we in the third book of the, the what they commonly call the Torah section, um, which is uh, you know Gen- uh, Leviticus. And as we look at uh, the beginning, like I said. The word for uh, it opens up with um, the first part of Leviticus, where you know it talks about it's called the whole book is called Yerma Yikra, and he called. And it's a similar thing uh, that we say mostly on a regular that um, from in the prayers to Ami and uh, the part of the Amida 
or, or some people refer to as a Shemoya, as Ray is when we, um, we get to the, the Kadusha part. And it's usually set with, you know, 10 people. When it's, you know, which is when God had called the Moses, it uses a, a, a language or a theme that's similar to where you find Isaiah. When, it's, uh, when the angels stood, stood in the one of Isaiah's visions, and they say, you know, you know, you know, you know, Korah is, uh, yeah, Korah, say, say, you know, they call one another and say, Quadosh, 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 and then I said, oh, you know, you know, so they, 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 they use that um, phrase. So they, when you look at the book of the opening part of Leviticus, we actually um, uh, symbolically put these. Uh, ascending on a higher level, and this is one of the processes that teaches how to get on a higher level. So, though Leviticus talks about a lot of sacrifices here, and we mentioned already in the first part of uh, Wayukra, it talks about five different sacrifices. And here, when we get into this particular portion of um, Saul, uh, we have those uh, five sacrifices being enumerated again. Now, what makes a unique difference, I know a lot of people in, in modern times say, uh, why should I be focusing on the sacrifices um, in modern times? Since we don't have a temple, i never seen an official sacrifice done the way the book prescribed it because we don't have the spot to do it. So why even study that? And then, um, and then we're talking about five major categories of uh, sacrifice, uh, sacrifices that's done. At the Mishkan, excuse me, and it's done at the, um, the temple itself when the temple was erected. All right. So when we look at those areas there, we find that the five uh, sacrifices, when we get into the book of uh, this particular portion of, of Saul, the five sacrifices itself. Uh, when we with the first part, it focused on the actual sinner in uh, the last portion we read in Leviticus. It focused on the sinner more so than the sacrifice. Though it says, you know, if such and such sin, this is what you got to do. If that's enough sin, this is what they got to do. All the way down, starting with the, you know, and it deals with five categories of people in the community, like I said. You know, you start off with the priest and then start off with the leadership congregation, which is like, um, Today, they were, you know, um, like, you know, the, the leaders of the different people as a congregation, such as, uh, you know, the princes, the chiefs, the elders, you know, that kind of congregation. Or some people might say the Sanhedrin. I, when they, you know, I talk about if they sin, you know, start with the uh, Kohen, and then it goes back with the Sanhedrin or the leaders of the congregation. Then it goes with the individual leader, almost like a prince or king, as you would say. Um, when he said, and it talks about the people as a whole, the populace as a whole, and then it goes to the individual. That's the way the first part is, but it's focused on people, um, sins, you know, mistakes, the errors, you know, how they fell out, and they need to get closer back to the creator. All right. While when we get into this particular portion of Leviticus, now, it going to focus on the actual sacrifices itself. So, uh, as I said before, we started to talk about the rules of operation of the house. Um, also, we look at the five sacrifices, which um, I enumerate before. I right. you talk about uh, the ole, the burnt offering that burns up. You got the ole, all right. Then um, you had, uh, uh, after that, you had a, a kata. And then, then after that, <clears throat> you, have, you know, you have um, what they call um, the, 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 the asham, you know, uh, offering. I, yeah, you know, you, you had a um, shaman offerings, you know, um, that you have there. Um, well, I'm hmm. Let me show you. But um, the five, five, um, the five categories that we talk about here, yeah, you know, in uh, in the offerings, we have five different categories that's um, related to the five books that we could we place them all into the five books. 
And when we think about the the the, the, the different offerings, oh, the thanks offering, that's why that felt. So the, the thanks offerings, uh, which is broken down to that. So now let's go back and say, well, how do they represent the first five and other books, the five books of uh, what we commonly call the Torah? Well, the first time you talk about sacrifices, the first one to ever man that attempted to serve God through sacrifice happened to be Cain. So that's the first one that actually decided to try to give an offering and sacrifice to God. Um, and then his brother Abel has stepped it up. So though Cain brought a sacrifice and he brought the produce of the ground, uh, it focused more on the quality of the sacrifice that his brother Abel did. So therefore, his sacrifice was accepted. So when we, th- when we talk about that, so that would represent the Ola offering, the offering that's constantly consumed on the altar that no, not even the Kohen himself takes a part of, you know, eats again any, anything from that. It's completely burned up on the altar. On the altar. So hence the Ola offerings would represent and emulate that of uh, the, 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 um, the Kohen, you know, um, himself. Um, then, a uh, man offer, that's why I left out the man offer. And um, after five. So then when when we go beyond that, um, we got to think about the next one. You find out Noah is another man that offered offer, offerings up, a Ola offering. After he came out and was saved from the mound, the the marble the marble just the flood, so he offered up Ola offering, and then we know with the patriarchs Abraham, he made an offer of his son Isaac, and then in that place he got a, a ram and he offered up an Isaac, and we know that Jacob himself had an offer, an Ola offering. So Ola, or the burnt offerings as he would say. Is something that you get nothing from it um, that you take from that. Everything's completely consumed on the altar. So hence, we got that's what we represent those areas of of Genesis: self surrender, not asking for anything in return, and reference to the offerings going forward. So then, then that's why the Ola offering will represent Genesis, and then we go into the book of Exodus. And as we go into the book of Exodus and we think about, all right, what's going on there? You know, and then making of a nation. So we'll be the next offering of there, you know, that will represent uh, the the nation itself. You know, and, and then when we think about that, then we think about the, the Katat offering. I, I, the, um, the, uh, the Katat offering, in, 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 in that sense, uh, we think about, you know, and sin just means purification all the time. It doesn't mean that you get something wrong directly. But, you know, but, but you, 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 you have a distance from the Creator. So when we think about the Katat offering, um, um, better yet, let me reverse that. And me, just let me reverse that just a, a bit. I think about the mink uh, mink offers. Let's this uh, the katat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with that uh, in, in this particular portion. I when we when we, when we look at the Genesis, uh, I mean Exodus story. I we have the Passover story. We had the plays coming in and stuff like that. But uh, the, the the first uh, offering we had as a people that we did was the Passover lamb. But what is unique <clears throat> in the Passover? Um, is the Minka, you know, the Minka offering. And what, what's unique about when we talk about the Minka offering, now Minka, we know could sometimes could be, uh, you know, meat and it could be grain. But what's unique about it is that we always have, um, during this particular season, we have what they call Kaka Masa, you know, when we're done the Passover. So what is unique is that 
all our sacrifices to have any kind of bread or grain, pretty much, has to be unleavened, which is called masa. That is unique to us as a people. So when we deal with the, the Passover uh, redemption, part of our redemption process, though we have the lamb, yes, and though we have that sacrifice, though we have that we could eat it and partake of it, you know, I mean, <clears throat> outside the, um, you know, you know, outside of our, you know, house, we could eat, you know, eat of it um, at that time inside your house. We know automatically that the actual um, main thing that carries on is not so much that particular night, which is only a few hours to the sunrise, but the main thing is our leavened bread. Now, no people, you know, that we know of uh, perpetuate eating, you know, masa, unleavened bread. No matter how flavorful it is, they don't perpetuate that. That's uniquely a people of Israel. You know, you don't go to the market and buy all year long. You can buy collar all year long. And we also have, you know, sometimes where um, bread with leavening is used, but it's never put up on the altar with the leavening. But the actual um, main cut off the meal off and the grain offering, um, that is mostly uh, representative of the children of Israel. So hence the second book of Exodus Will reflect the Menka offering, where the first represent uh, the Ola, the second represent the Menka offers, and now here we are in the book of um, Wayikra, so uh, Leviticus. So in the book of Leviticus, that represent the next offering that we would talk about would be the Katat, the sin offering, and it opens up about if the person sin, you know, start off with the various people that sin, and how to get close to the Creator. So that would represent the sin offering. And like I said, sin don't, it's not always a thing of you did something wrong because as we go through the book of Leviticus, we're going to find also, um, you know, sometimes a person, you know, could be, become, um, uh, you know, un, un, unclean. And we talk about a woman having a childbirth, which could come up in a little while. So when a woman have childbirth, she's following a commandment. So she haven't did anything wrong by bringing forth a child in the world, or she not uh, did she didn't do anything wrong to go through her particular cycle. So therefore, you know the sin offering is not always you might have did something wrong, but you're not pure enough. You you know so you became a distant from God. Now mind you, sometimes you did do something wrong, but it's those are mostly those in unintentional sins, but. It's also represent a, a thing of purity, you know, purification, right? So uh, the, 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 the English connotation of sin offering doesn't reflect how the book, you know, shows sin offering to be. So hence the third, uh, third offering I'm, I'm speaking about, the katat offering that we reflect the book of Leviticus. Now we get into the book of Numbers, you know, Asham. Asham is actually a guilt offering, you know? And when we talk about the guilt offering of Asham, that is very, very, very hostile because guilt is like a betrayal of an individual. You know, you betray the trust of another individual. So when you talk about an Asham offering, then you actually did something very, very tragic. Now, Let's look and reflect just a little bit before I go into a little bit in, in, uh, into the um, the offerings. When look at the book of Numbers, all right, and let's look at the book of Leviticus. Now here we have in the book of Leviticus, uh, the reason it represents a sin offering in Leviticus is because we already have the tabernacle built when we get into the book of Leviticus. And we, we already built it up, you know, at, you know, it had to be closed up in um, Exodus. And now we have the tabernacle built. And the tabernacle represent a bringing us back close from something that we did, you know, erroneous and allowed ourselves to be 
and rodents have been um, defiled by. And before that, before we talk about the sacrifices in Leviticus and how we're supposed to do them, we find the main thing they had and they built before that was they built the actual golden calf. So when they built the golden calf and Moses had to pray for us and bring back the second set of tablets, now you have a tabernacle that shows the area of God want to be closer and allowing us to be forgiven by him. So hence, that's why we have the operation of the, um, pretty much of the, the tabernacle that's going to be an operative mold during this particular time, you know, and so the preparation on it. So that's why it's represented also the Kata offering, which is opposed to the book of Numbers. Numbers is talking about a sham, a betrayal. Why? Because the tabernacle is already in full flesh. The priest order is already in existence and everything is running smooth. But we have all these big rebellions. One of the big rebellions we have is, uh, you know, we don't want to we, uh, we don't want to go into the land. You know, we want to kill Moses. You know, we talk about, you know, I mean, the, the, the manna. So we do a lot of, and, and that's most of our history is in the book of Numbers. So hence, the guilt offering is worse than a sin offering. In the book of Numbers, we did more treacherous sin where a generation of people that left Egypt, a male's 20 and over, over, you know, other than, like I say, those that might have been from the tribe of Lewi or, or the Nashim, the women. Um, those they, for 20 years old, the whole generation had to be wiped out in the book of Numbers. So hence, the Asham, the guilt offering, is the most serious offense that we had. We I mean, had God allow us to bring something for that. All right? But that's the most serious offense. And that's why it reflects the book of Numbers. And then we go into the area of the thanks offerings, you know, the Shlemane, the, the total of the thanks uh, offerings that we have there. So hence that would represent, you know, from the end of Numbers going into the, the book of Deuteronomy, because the Deut book, book of Deuteronomy, um, Devarim, as we, you know, we say, is only basically we're talking about a little bit more than a month, the book of Deuteronomy. So a little bit more than a month. So we have, you know, the, the, the slay meme offerings, you could say, uh, would be the tail end of by um, uh, by numbers going into Deuteronomy. Because Deuteronomy, you know, when Moses gives his discourse, it's basically about 30 some days. So, and we get that from the opening book of uh, Deuteronomy. You know, so the, the information is given there. So um, out of all the offerings we talk about before, you know, we, we had to focus on that offering there, uh, the thanks offering. And um, I'm going to say you know, the thanks offerings included within the Shlami. And it's more talked about the Shlami offering and the thank offerings and, um, than any other offering in detail. So, but I'm just going to open up a little bit because um, I'm looking at my time here, and um, I, I possibly will revisit um, some of the stuff here that I just spoke on today. So, hence, just to recap, Ola, Genesis, uh, um, Menka, Exodus, you know, Kata, Leviticus, Ashan, Numbers, Menka, or Shlemy, 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 rather, Shlemy offerings. You know, you're talking um, uh, Deuteronomy. All right, so the five offerings represents those five books in that order. <clears throat> All right, so it opens up, and, um, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is that which goes up on the firewood upon the altar all night until the morning, and the, fi and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning thereby. All right. <clears throat> First, I think, let's look at the opening uh, in the Hebrew. All right. It said, Moshe, Lemur. 
Zah ed ha aharon ed vana. Ne mo zot Torah. This is the Torah. You know, haola, who haola al mokda. The word mokda, that's mostly translated as, as the fire or the flame on, on it. It said, al ha mezbia ko ha laila, al ad ha boker ve esh ha mezbia, you know, tokad, both. All right, so that 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 um that flame <coughs> that he got to keep burning, you know, is actually the fire that came down after you know the um Aaron, was, um, the sons became operative. Like I said before, the book is not in the chronological order, and I'm gonna you know further bring out some more information in reference to that. Because a lot of times when we read these stories, we, you know, it's like, did I, did I miss something over here? You know, why I focus over here? And I always had to um, reiterate it with different people that I might talk to, you know, during the week, that it's not in a chronological order. You got to maintain the, the memory, you know, exercise a memory of chronological order and also be aware of the events that took place. So, here it is that we focus on the operation of how the sacrifices itself should be offered and operated upon. But Aaron's job, the priest's job, and we know Aaron is not already anointed and consecrated as a priest, him or his, uh, or his sons yet. We're going to find a little bit of that in next week's Sidra. We know that this particular weekend, of the, the, the portion saw usually comes in a little before Pesach, but always after, usually after, always. Um, the season of Purim. This year we happen to have a, you know, Adashini and the way the calendar works, which is another story. But then, um, like I say, but it always the word saw, saw always comes up before Passover and it, um, it tends to, you know, have a lot of relationship with Passover itself. So, um, but which has happened to be another story in that sense. But talking about the fire. That came down the, the fire that they had <clears throat> when Ammon um, was on the altar is not the same fire that Moses was doing and offering up prior to the consecration of Aaron and his sons. So I just want to bring that out because a lot of times when we talk about the fire, we think about hey, that's the same one Moses was using. No, it's not the same one Moshe had used. You know, the fire talks about later on was when Aaron was officially consecrated. And that fire had to stay on and had to be maintained by uh, Aaron, the Kohen himself, Hakohen. All right. And it said all night. So he got to put enough wood upon the fire. But the first job he had as a as a as a priest, and it goes on to say, um, the third verse, and the priest shall put on his linen garments and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh. And he shall take up the ashes whereto the fire had consumed the burnt offering on the altar and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be kept burning thereby and shall not go out. And a priest shall kindle wood on it every morning and shall lay the burnt offering in order upon it and shall make smoke the, uh, the fat of the peace offering. Fire shall be kept burning upon the altar continually and shall not go out. First question and you will say, when did a man get a time off? Do he, he got, you know, because it's his job to make sure that the fire is, to, you know, is, uh, is burning. And, uh, the the hawkorn. And it's his job also to take the ashes, put on the linen garments and take the ashes. Some he put down on the side of the altar and prepare and, and, and then Later on, he takes some ashes and take it outside to a clean place, All right, a certain, you know, another spot. But 
It's his job. You figure the highest spiritual man in the nation got to do the grunt, low work of sweeping up, cleaning up, maintenance. Maintenance is on him of the tabernacle. And he's the highest man. So a lot of times when people think about leadership, the leader got to be able to do the grunt work. And uh, there's very few places that I know of with actual leaders. I, 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 you know, I've been privileged to see a lot of leaders do, you know, coming up, you know, from my time. And um, I'm proud to say uh, different brothers, you know, that I'm, you know, I'll be around, you know, like, you know, you know DCB brothers, Shema brothers, um, even uh, Bay Shalom brothers. This, this, I'm only speaking about what I witnessed firsthand. You know, so I'm not saying it doesn't exist in uh, all the communities as a whole. I'm not saying that, but this is stuff I'm I'm talking about. I only can testify to what I know. That different leaders of these particular spots that I'm around, I've been around, you know, a few, but I don't know how they work, you know, on on the side, anything like that. That the leaders actually um, of those particular spots, I've seen them, you know. Rabbi's chief and prince, you know, doing grunt work. When you figure everybody else should be doing it. Now, when in this particular case here, that you find that the Kohen, the hot Kohen, had to handle that ashes. He had to set the wood up. He had to make sure it's done. And he had to carry it out. He couldn't allow nobody else to do that. That's his job. For him, that's why it's talking about command Aaron, not speak to him, just say. Command that this got to be done in a specific manner. There's no deviation from this service. So the higher you climb, you know what I mean, the spiritual ladder, the more humble you got to be. You know, the, you know what I mean, there's, you know, there's no nobility without responsibility. And that's what um that's what's bring, brought out here in this area here. I um I like to just go on and just fast forward a, a little bit. And <clears throat> I'll revisit some of this stuff later on. But it talks about um I'm skip down to the twelfth verse. I'm gonna just figure um it talks about the offering of the, the anointed priest and me the high priest. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which I shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is anointed. The tenth part of an ephah of fine flour for a meal offering perpetually, half of it in the morning and half thereof in the evening on a griddle, it shall be made with oil. When it is soaked, thou shalt bring it in in broken pieces shall thou offer the meal offering for a sweet savior unto the Lord. And the anointed priest that shall be and instead from among his sons shall offer it. It is due, it is a due forever. It shall be wholly made to smoke unto the Lord. And every meal offering of the priest shall be wholly made to smoke. It shall not be eaten. That is for Aaron and his sons. But first Aaron and then whoever become the high priest after that. This just basically the high priest thing that um, he do. All right, so now, um, we we'll speak more about the anointing and revisit again of, of, of the Kohanim in that area there. All right, so I'm gonna skip just a little bit down and the 11th verse of the uh, seventh chapter, seven eleven. All right, I'm going to just skip on that and bring out a couple points. And like I said, I'll be skipping and I'll come back to it. Um, certain, certain parts depends on the questions that's asked um, from those that view this uh, uh, yeah, YouTube program. So 7-Eleven said, And this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which one may offer unto the Lord. If he offer it for thanksgiving, then... He shall offer it with the sacrifice of thanksgiving, unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers spread with oil, cakes mingled with oil, and fine flour soaked. 
right, with the cakes of leavened bread, he shall present his offering with the sacrifice of his peace offering for Thanksgiving. All right. What is interesting here, um, I'm not going to go into the, 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 the depths of it, um, but what's interesting here is this, that <clears throat> this is under the Shalami offerings, complete offerings, peace offerings, and in, in this particular part called thanks. The word he uses is toda in Hebrew. Now, we know what toda mean, mean as we use today, thanks. But it don't say thankful for what? So you, you know, so you say, well, uh, well, things work out. I got this blessing over here. I got that blessing. I'm thankful. <clears throat> it doesn't, you know, and, and you say, well, okay. <clears throat> then if you're thankful every day, do you bring a thanks offering every day? So when do this would apply? Because most of the times, you know, people ask you how you feel. Well, they ask me how, you, how I'm feeling. I say, I'm thankful. You know, and I might say, Baruch Hashem after that. I say, you know, I mean, you know I'm thankful. And I might say, Baruch Hashem. But, but, but actually, how thankful can I be? Because if I'm thankful that much every day, then I'm going to be busy, man, every single day bringing up a thanks offering if I'm trying to say I'm really, truly thankful. So it doesn't describe here what you're thankful for. Some of us that, um, <clears throat> that follow a certain tradition might rise up in the morning and we'll say the prayer, you know, Mode Anila Fenecha. All right. So the word Mode, we say, you know, is thanks. I'm giving thanks. But Mode itself, when you say Mode, it's a little different than the Toda. Mode is like I acknowledge something that I need to be thankful for. That I didn't, I, you know, I was thankful at the time it happened, but I really didn't do anything to really respond to how grateful I was for that. So you're developing that attitude of thanks. And to say, so when you say mo day, it's not saying like toda, when somebody doing something right then, immediate. It's like you reflect later on and say, wow, I should be thankful that I was in a, a serious, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I was in a serious jam, you know, I mean, a serious, serious jam. And I'm, I said I was thankful, but I didn't do anything to prove that I was thankful. And you're reflecting back. So now you really acknowledge so the, the more day when you say uh, more day, that's like, uh, because they say, uh, you know, more day I need, you know, as, as opposed to, you know, uh, you can say more Manaknu. We say that a lot of times on the, on the, on the, on the prayer for we conclude everybody. But when you do that, you acknowledge something that you're going to perform and do in response to the gratitude that you have that had already happened in the past that you neglected to do something for. I hope I'm making sense to you know, most of the people that's out there. So that's the difference between Mode and the thanks offers. So they, um, they um, traditionally they say, well, four areas when a person was like, you know, went through a, a deep imprisonment where his life was at stake or a torture. Um, you know, they used, to, you know, they, they should bring a thanks offering. You know, a, a, a person that had a, a serious ailment, you know, or something life threatening and they was fully healed. Now, we ain't talking about a cold, you know, a little bit of a flu, uh, you know, because everything could be life threatening. But they said, you know, something that's really, really life threatening. Um, uh, if you had a stroke, you know, I mean, if you had a cancerous thing and they say, well, you got rid of the cancer, completely gone. Then they have a prayer in most prayer books called a Gomel. All right. That's another story. But um, that's um, when you uh, have a thankful, um, um, bring a thanks offering for something like that. And then when you travel over um, um, a C, you know, these are acronym for the word um, Kain, which is um, life uh, in the plural. You know, and when you travel over the sea, um, which is the arm itself, that's, you never know. And I mean, uh, we ain't talking about a little lake, a little river, taking a, a little boat ride around Manhattan Island or something like that. When you're traveling across the waves, across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, across a major ocean, you know, and the waves, there's no guarantee you're going to make it. Then, you know, 
that's when you say you have a thanks, you a real, real gratitude. You know, um, when you're traveling in the desert, you know, uh, by Midbar, you know, when you're traveling in the desert, then you have a, a attitude of thanks. So those areas there, um, that you know, uh, they, they 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 say you should focus on thanks. And uh, in the desert area, like a lot of times, from say, you fly from New York to California. Naturally, you're, you're thankful that the plane landed safe, took off well, and landed safe. But they don't consider that, in a sense, uh, you know, um, you know, traveling over in the desert. When you try to say in a desert area, they think of like you got to think of an antiquity, so to speak. That I don't know if I'm gonna make it out of this. When you're in the sea, most people that's in the navy, like I got a grandson that's in the navy and stuff like that. You be out there for weeks and don't see anything but waters, and, and you look up, you might see some stars, but you don't see anything else but water. When you touch shore, you say, "Wow, you know, I'm thankful that I may have made it." Because you know, and some people really we have psychological problems behind that being out there like that. Or being in a desert area in the wasteland for a long time, people have psychological problems like that. So the thanks offering is an offering that's something that um, is treated. With more, you know, more, uh, with, with much more lo um, um, uh, love because you invite other people with to this year, a particular offering, you know, and a thanks offering. Um, now, is the value of the offering important? Um, it got a, a certain criteria for if you could afford to bring, a, you know, I mean, a, you know, a ram or a goat or, you know, a bullock, you know. If you can afford that, that's going to cost much financial more money, you know, than, than if you're going to bring some turtle doves, that can cost you, you know, a, a little less money. But then if you bring just grain, you know, the grain that men go off, it's more valuable, more treated more with more love than the one that brought the big offering up. All right. The thing is that you bring in an offering, the creator makes it available, not so much of the value but because the creator values us, you know? So we don't look at the offering we bring up as the value and saying, look, I'm bringing this up. So he should really accept me because of that. You know, and, and, and a lot of people think with, with Cain that, oh, he didn't bring enough, he didn't bring the better, but it was about the quality and the spirit that he brought his offering up as opposed to Havel that brought the offering up. So the thing is, when we look, uh, what we bring into the creator is the spirit that we bring it in. Um, and I just want to bring one more thing before I go into the Proverbs. Um, and then, uh, like I said, oh, oh, two more things here in this particular portion before I go into the Proverbs. Uh, one thing, um, uh, uh, Mokda, that word there, have a small mem. Now, you're going to find every letter in the Olive Bait somewhere in the scriptures with a Either an extra large letter in some words or an extra small letter in some words. But <clears throat> in this particular um, letter, Mem itself, um, it brings out and focuses on, you, you're going to find it that you have what they call a Mem Sophie and a regular Mem. You know, the regular Mem has an opening and, and the Mem Sophie is like a close. And they got a lot of um, uh, lectures and stuff in reference to that. Those, those um, everybody that used symbolisms. But what's interesting is that in one part of the prophets, the, 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 the mem sophie is always is at the end of a word. And you know, it's never in the middle of the word. So you're going to find, and, and, and I bring it out next time, you know, that um, you're going to find a mem sophie in the middle of a word, and you're going to find it within the prophets. And you're going to find um also the the regular mem at the end of a word written the, the normal way that we see it at the beginning or the middle of a word and you're gonna find that also in the prophets so uh, that you know if i you know, get a chance to around to we'll discuss that next time in reference to those different sizes of, of, of letters there and um i just um read this here last paragraph and the 30, uh, 735, it says, um, the 7th chapter, 35th verse, it says, this is a consecrated portion of Aaron 
and a consecrated portion of his sons out of the offerings of the Lord made by fire in the day when they were presented to minister unto the Lord in the priest's office, which the Lord commanded to be given them of the children of Israel in the day that they were anointed. It is a due forever throughout your generations. So it talks about in that day, then um, that they are anointed. Let you know that we already had the formula before they got prepared. You know, and so Moses, when we get into the next week's portion, um, you're going to talk about the actual, um, um, you know, consecration of Aaron and his sons for those eight days. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we're not looking at in the order because when you read it now, he's getting this command, and but yet he's not qualified to exercise that command. So we read the command prior. So in other words, we got to have plans. We got to sit down. And have you know, and have have things mapped out. A lot of times we can't move, you know, um, you know, like at the spur of the moment, just you know, wing it as we go. And this was one of the things that it teaches you in Torah that things is planned out before the plan is implemented. You know, it's it's a thought process, and then it's actual a work process. So this is what we learn um, from 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 this particular area dealing with the. Uh, you know, the, the priesthood and Aaron and himself as we go into the book of uh, Saul. So we're going to um, move forward um, to the uh, book of Proverbs. And um, we're going to um, go from the 25th chapter of the Proverbs. Which is, uh... We're going to the book of Proverbs. Yeah, 25. Chapter 25, verse 1. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to uh, talk about um, Proverbs. All right, I'd like to bring out also, as we think about the book of Proverbs, 25th chapter, is and now we're starting into what they consider the fourth book of the Proverbs. And uh, because it's breaking sections, but it's an interesting opening as Proverbs open up in this particular chapter. And uh, we talked about it earlier that um, Solomon wrote much more. Proverbs than we have in our book, you know, and then this is one of some historical things here, and the pattern of the the first couple of chapters of Proverbs, uh, this particular book of Proverbs, um, in the collection, it opens up a little bit different. So you can start off from um, reading the beginning. In the book of Proverbs, chapter twenty-five, starting from verse one, Hallelujah. Yeah. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. Hold on right there. That's important to know. That Solomon, though he wrote the Proverbs, and we got the Proverbs here, that it's letting you know automatically that from this portion here, a few here, this is what somebody else decided to insert. And then when we think about King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah dealt with the, the reform of uh you know of, of of Jerusalem and you know what's interesting about the reform of Jerusalem it's a uh, he became king in his reign is a couple years after the northern kingdom or a year or two after the northern kingdom was taken into Assyria and then Judah you know and everybody else realized hey um uh, them ten tribes are gone we need to straighten up and therefore he had religious reform at this particular time so his his reign is basically from um you know, give or take 720 BCE to about 692 BCE. All right. So when we think about uh, King Hezekiah, he did a lot of reforms. Um, you know, when, when people started worshiping everything, but Judah wasn't quite as bad as the northern kingdom was. And, uh, you know, so they was taken up by the Assyrians and basically 621, you know, uh, I mean, 721 BCE, some would give or take, <clears throat> um, or some would say 722 BCE. So give or take, circle that they was taken into captivity amongst the Assyrians, and they were spread out amongst the Assyrian Empire. So hence, you, you know, you start the, the concept of the, say they say the 10 lost tribe, because a lot of them didn't maintain that identity throughout the empire that they were spread within. You know, which brings about another story, because like I said, um, um, 
and um, normally when you talk about Shabbat, um, Shabbat uh, Para, and it dealt with the red heifer. That was a Shabbat that just passed. Um, then usually you have a different um, reading that they deal with and stuff like that. And it's um, in reference to purification and about death and about war. You know, and they usually read the portion, of the Mufti portion, we're dealing with the, the, the red heifer coming from Numbers, the 19th um, chapter, first verse to the 22nd verse. And um, they usually um, go into a, a, a little bit of a, uh, I believe Ezekiel, you know, in reference to that for the Haftorah. But the thing is that Reformation, you know, is when you try to turn back to the Creator, repentance is a strong revolution. And that's a revolution against the wrong thing and trying to get back to the right thing. So here it is that Hezekiah and them, he tried to do a Reformation in the nation of Israel. And also, what's interesting is that during his time, it's the first time you read about that they are observing Passover, which is, you know, coincidental that it's coming up soon. But he have a Passover, you know, in a second month. But he took counsel. And speaking of counsel, you know, you know, and an elder agreed. So, you know, I was tasked with trying to revitalize and operate the uh, elders council. Um, and one of the things I find in dealing with the, uh, um, is getting the people that's where it's already there that's still, you know, healthy enough that we want to deal with it. And then also people that want to be bothered with giving advice. And I said the elders council, and that's exactly literally what I mean in the sense of giving advice, not like a judicial body, but just giving advice as related to Torah. And a lot of people in societies, when you don't have an elders, um, you're, you're doing, you're, uh, you're, that society is doing. Um, congregations where you have very little elders or don't have respect for elders, they don't last long. You know, that, that, that's, that's been my experience throughout history. That if you don't have an elders and stuff in the congregation, somebody can have counsel. I said, the wise man that ever lived, King Solomon, had a council of elders. And he knew more than they did as an individual. As far as wisdom go, he had more of that than, you know, than they had. So you would say, why would he have counselors if what they could tell him he could figure out, <laughs> you know? But the thing is that it's, it's, it's safety in counsel because sometimes you may know something and go against something, you know, that you know better. And we got that experience with Solomon even in the midst of those things. So it does, uh, hence, and his, and his elders outli um, out, out, outlived him. Because that the elders that counseled his father, Rearborn had the opportunity to use those. They said, no, I got my own new crew. You know, and it caused a problem. <clears throat> so, and, um, so when we talk about uh, King Hezekiah, um, he was um, a unique man in, in, when he had Passover in the second month, took counsel when he was there. And you read about it, it said, um, God forgave them. We don't read that in the scripture. But the writer said, if it was not so, it would not be written. So we got to go with that. <laughs> it sounds like somebody was a eyewitness there. So sometimes we, you know, and one of the things we're going to learn in this particular Proverbs is that, you know, you don't question too much things when it concerns to God. You know, and a lot of us try to figure everything out with God. Because when, since God made man, God got to have a nose because he smells sweet savior. You know, God got to have eyes because you see everything. God got to have a mouth because you still do a little talking every now and then. God got to have a hand because he brought us out of Egypt with an outstretched hand and mighty arm. So even Egyptian recognize he got some fingers on that hand. You know, God, God got to have feet because Adam heard him walking in the cool of the day. So we have everything from our own body, you know that we ascribe to God. God made us and we constantly, constantly making the creator, you know? So this is something to consider and as we go forward in this Proverbs, all right, continue. Proverbs. Two, second two, verse. Um, verse two. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. All right, so that means right there, don't, don't think too much about God. 
I'm trying to figure everything that God do. I'm trying to figure out what God is all the way. I got to know everything about the creator. No, don't worry about that part. No, understand what, what, what his will is, and that's good enough right there for us. But it's for kings to search out the matter because now you're dealing with the realm of things, of possibilities and, and evidence here. You're dealing with people up close and personal. So therefore, you just can't um, leave something open for second guess. That's why I says for kings to search out the matter, you know, because he's a high authority as a judge. All right, continue. Verse 3, it reads, the heaven for height and the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. Wow, now this seems like a little different here. All right. The heavens, we say, well, how high is something? Well, you know, it reaches up to heaven. How low is that? Like the depths of the earth down there, like that chasm down there. You know, we have some kind of formula of, 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 of measurement. That's what it means. We got a, a formula of measurement. We say, man, it's so high, man, it touched the sky. You know, it's so low, go below the floor, you know, or, or go to the floor. Uh, we say them things there. So that means we have a certain measuring um, limit. Whereas when it comes to the king and the way he moves and his emotions, if his emotions get the best of him and stuff like that, you know, it, it goes on to tell you, you know, you know, uh, right then and there, that the heart of a king is unsearchable. We don't know how he feel today. He got these mood swings. He's human. He got these mood swings. So I can't say for a certain that tomorrow he's going to be all right in a good mood. So that's one of the things it brings out. Continue. Verse 4, it reads, Take away the drawers from the silver, and there cometh forth a vessel for the refiner. Take away right, the wicked from before the king, and his throne shall be established in righteousness. Okay. That means you got to get rid of something that's not good. That's it. Period. You know what I mean? So if you get rid of the wicked individual that's around the king, all right, then he's going to be a good king. Because if enough people be in your ears, it, that's that's an indoctrination. We call it indoctrination, but enough people in your ears, you know, so that's, that's what we're being warned against. Continue. Six. It, it reads, Glorify not thyself in the presence of the king and stand not in the place of great men, for better it is that it... For better is it that it be said unto thee, come up hither, than thou shouldest be put lower in the presence of the prince whom thine eyes have seen. Mm. All right, right then and there. I said, <laughs> don't be going for your own self-glory. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because right, a lot of people, uh, you know, and we're going to talk about that again within this Proverbs, you know what I mean? But, you know, you know when you're in the presence of the king, well, look, you know, I got this kind of value, man. You know, this is what I could do for you, you know, oh, Lord, King. You know what I mean? This, I'm going to tell you some of my credentials. You know what I mean? I'm going I'm to break down my resume. This stuff here, you know, that we got to must be uh, careful about when you're in the presence of somebody of authority. So now, today in society, we talk about the workers' rights, the unions and all this here kind of stuff. But if your supervisor on your job is the supervisor there, all right, then his word going to hit a lot more quicker home than your word with your union in the background. So that's why it, it, it teaches you how to behave yourself in the presence of, of, of authority. All right, that's what it's, 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 you learn here. Continue. Verse 8. Go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy uh -huh. neighbor has put thee to shame. Uh huh. The All right, right then and there. Mm -hmm. All right. Look, right then and there. Don't don't be running to do things. We we um the difference between these proverbs that we talk about, as compared to the proverbs we read previously, is that normally it's a teacher to a student, you know, a father to a son, but as we go into the proverbs from this point here. For the next few um, proverbs, we're going to actually just hear um, different old sayings and both sayings that is general, you know, but but not not a personal thing. Of I'm the teacher or I'm the king, and you are my son or you are my student, and just telling you how to behave yourself, all right, in the presence of people like that.
Uh, continue. Verse 9, it reads, Debate thy course with thy neighbor, but reveal not the secret, secret of another, lest he that heareth it revile thee, and thine infamy turn not away. Okay, right then and there. <clears throat> when, you know, you know, one of the things you got to worry about is bringing out evil talk. All uh, right. And, and, and you know, and and, and 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 talking about secrets. You know, most times your neighbor, if you talk to your neighbor, most times what you're going to speak about, if he's your neighbor, you're going to talk about their family matters. That's what you're mostly going to talk about. You say, well, he cool. He really right next door. He might have heard this or heard that, or I might go on something like that. So a lot of times you tend to share things with people that's close with you. And the thing is that you got to be careful. And it's more so talking about um, sometimes, in, you know, and, um, when we look in ancient times, we're thinking about family matters, you know, and, and, and about pe people who complain about their parents. I know coming up as a young guy, you know, people could be complaining about and, and their moms or their pops, you know, tore them up for this or doing, tore them up for that, man. So-and-so told on them and stuff like that, or they, they couldn't go out there, you know, play ball or go to a party or something like that. So, um, and, and, and um, or they might say, and I brought my, uh, I brought a, a slip home from school from a, uh, from, from, from a parent or somebody to sign, you know, and they didn't know how to write or they couldn't read the, uh, read the note that was there, the permission slip. So those things there, you know, you don't shed light on, on your parents like that. You don't bring family matters out in the street too tough like that. You know, I mean, you got to be careful about what you bring out to your neighbor because he got a neighbor too. <laughs> you ain't the only neighbor on the block, you know, and that's how things run. Continue. Verse 11 reads, a word, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and settings of silver. As an uh -huh. earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient heir. Okay, right then and there. All right. We know gold is more precious than silver, but silver is stronger than gold, you know, in that sense. So if you're going to set something in there, you're going to set the gold, you know, you know, if the gold is made like a, you know, a gem or something like that, you know, you set it in some silver, you know, but you're a little more strong, a little more attackable. Um, normally, when you, when you buy, have big diamonds, major jewelry and stuff like that, um, the settings, have more be a white gold and that's why in the bigger gold you know a bigger diamonds and all that stuff they call it in platinum and all that because it's stronger than a plain yellow gold so you got 24 karat yellow gold but it's not that strong so if you had a diamond or different precious stones in there it could wear out quicker you know what i mean in the sense of you know you could lose it you know um, so that's why um if a, if, if, if a gem or something is really precious they put it in a setting of, uh, you know, white gold, which basically got a silver context or something like that. All right, continue. Verse 13. As the coal of snow in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to him that sendeth him, for he uh, refresheth right the soul of his master. Okay, right, right there, we're going to 14. All right, now, we got to think of who want coal and snow in harvest time? Do that make sense? It won't make sense to the normal guy over in America. You know, when you talk about, I got snow and cold, and I got to go ahead and harvest my grain. That You say, well, that don't really make sense. You know, so now we got to say, well, why would this writer consider putting this here if it, you know what I mean, it had to make sense to them? So why it seems so bizarre to me, just like, when you talk about the, the, the sacrifice offerings, it had to make sense to them. But me, I can't, you know, I mean, these days and times are so far removed, I can't imagine how that can help us. So what we find is that in the area of Israel, and mind you now, this is during King Hezekiah time, and where he at in Israel, all right? This is the man that he got together and got this collection together. So we got to look at the background. Uh, and and so in Israel, you have this mountain, Mount Hermon. It keeps it keeps snow all year long. Up there, Israel get very very hot. 
So when you're thinking about a person that's harvesting, you say the breeze coming down from the mountain be like a, almost like an air conditioner. We could push a button today and say, I need some AC. You know what I mean? But they didn't have that where they could say, I'll push a button and got AC out there in the field. You know, they didn't have all the machinery that we have today to say, well, I'm going to harvest stuff out in the field. So now, if you got a breeze coming off the mountaintop, going into the lower regions, you know, and, you know, the snow that's there, it's going to be like an air condition. And so that's what they're saying in reference to that, that they're looking for that area because it rarely ever snows in Israel, you know, on a the, on, on the regular low level. Now, it gets get some chilly, chilly days, though. But it rarely ever snow there. So the, the, when you talk about the harvest season, especially around the harvest season area, harvest time. So what they're talking about, why they're out there trying to collect the harvest of that they want a nice, cool breeze coming from the mountaintop, blowing off it to them so they could be able to work. And that's what they're describing it. And so that's how we got to uh, think about the people of the time as opposed to the way we live today. All right, continue. Verse 14. It reads, as vapors and wind without rain, so is he that boasteth himself of a false gift. All right, right then and there. I mean, brag, we, we say braggadocious, you know what I mean? You don't have anything, you know what I mean? And, and so, so it's like, you know, a vapor without rain. Vapor should be kind of wet. You know, it should have to, steam, steam got some moisture in it. So how do it exist without moisture? All right, continue. Verse 15, it reads, By long forbearing is a ruler persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. All right, that means right then, right then and there that um, not giving up, you know what I mean, but they got to know how to talk. You know, we, we heard before, a soft answer turns away wrath and grievous words stirs up strife. So the thing is that it's how you talk to somebody. Um, I remember, um, you know, one time, we, we, we had this discussion about, you know what I mean, um, so stuff that needed, you know, needed for the camp. You know, certain type of insurance policy. We had this big discussion. Or, you know, I know it's needed. I know it's thought to be needed forever. You hope, you hope it never needed. But I know it was, you know, it was that kind of security that it was needed. And I had to go for a few weeks of meetings back and forth you know, for a degree, and we didn't even get, you know, I mean, but I think less than six months, six months or something like that, where we're somewhere along there, where, you know, you had to tap into it, you know, and and and, and the thing is that it's because when 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 you know something is important, and you know something that's laudable, it's you know decently in order how you present it. Your presentation must be really, really considering the other guys because maybe they don't see what you see at that time, you know, maybe, you know, in, in that area. So you talk to somebody that's, you know, in more of authority than you in a certain area. So you got to say, well, I, I, it's not me that's doing this by himself. I need, I need, I need assistance from, a, you know, another source. So you have to watch your words and bring it. And it's not even about intimidation. It's about saying, making a strong relationship and see, you know, and then let the person see, the actual need as much as you would see the need. So that's what it's talking about in here in this particular verse. All right, continue. Verse 16, it reads, Has thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomit it. Uh -huh. Right then and there. So that, means, that means too much of anything. It's no good. That's all. Don't be a glutton. But, but, but we're going we're gonna to come back to that because there's going to be something in here that's similar to that. And that's the opposite, but go ahead, continue. It reads, verse 17. Let thy foot be seldom in thy neighbor's house, lest he be sated with thee and hate thee. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, now verse right in there. All right. Overdoing something is no good. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like you see these little calm, um, um, uh, you know, sitcoms and stuff like that. Guys always in your house more than you, you know. I mean, or you know, you used to, uh, you, I used to look at the Martin show and guy they called Brother Man. Next thing you know, you come to the fire escape going in your refrigerator more than you are coming in your refrigerator, you know. Um, or somebody's always knocking at your door, you know. And 
wearing your doorsteps out. They don't give you a chance to visit them, you know, because they, they early in the morning. You know, I know you had coffee, you know, and um, my father, blessed memory, he had a lot of people on the block that, you know, because he had the kind of kind heart that be there early in the morning and um, they ain't going to job, they ain't going to work. They're stopping, you know, stop to the house. I be up, my father be up, you know, be eight in the morning, knocking on the door, ringing the bell. Uh, it, 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 you know, my father's name was Sip, so he said, Sip in. <laughs> he retired. <laughs> you know, where you going? I said, yeah, well, I'm going to see him. He said, so what's going on? My father's real free. You know, yeah, I just came over here and see what, you know, what you got to drink. That's, that's, that's the kind of things, you know, because well, my, my, my father always has stuff, you know, he's feeding the neighborhood or they come there for, you know, coffee or pack up or lunch or sandwich or something. And then they're on their merry way every day. And we the same people. And I'm only there, I'm only visiting maybe about a week or two. And I see the same people like if they lived there, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's my father's house. So, I mean, uh, those are his people. I'm, I'm going to be going shortly. So the thing is that not one of them, not one, my father ever go to their house and visit, you know, and talk about, I'm going over to so-and-so house to get this or, uh, or that while I'm there. You know, so the thing is that you don't want to wear out your welcome. You got to be considerate. And that's what it's teaching you here. I right, continue. Verse 18, as a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow, so was a man that, that beareth false witness against his neighbor. All right, it's destructive. That's all it is. It's destructive. It tears it down. A maul is something that you beat like a hammer. All right, a sword is cutter, you know, and the arrow it is piercing. All right, so being a false witness against your neighbor, man, I mean, that, that that's not only part of the command, thou shalt not bear false witness. You know, that the creator smoke in Mount Sinai. But um, the thing is that, you know, it, 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 it could destroy an um, individual. You know, assassin, character assassination. Keep continue. 19. 19. Confidence in an unfaithful man is, man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Now, all of us that might have had a toothache in the past, we understand how that feels. All right? And some people that got bare feet, flat feet, you know what I mean? Bunions or corns or, you know, a shoe that might have fit one time. Next day, you know, your feet done change or whatever the case is. And a coin come up there and, you know, that's one of the worst feelings in the world. I said, that's the kind of individual, you know, when an unfaithful man in time of trouble, you know, your confidence in an unfaithful man. Somebody you can't count on when you need them. You know, that's one of the worst things, you know. And, um, and, and a lot of people, uh, hey, no, I got you, I got you, I got you. And, uh, and, but when they say they got you, you got to catch them. <laughs> you, know, them to get, you know, to get you. All right, but just continue, 20th. Verse 20, it reads, As one that taketh forth a garment in cold weather, and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. All right, that means out of place. Uh, uh, um, Jeremiah talked about nature to clean it, you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, let's say, look here, you got the wrong tune. That's right. You know, I, I, right now, I don't need to hear no song, the melody, you know, that stuff like that. Right now, I need, I need some soothing words. All right. Now, with Saul, and I have to bring this out because, uh, you know, Solomon is the son of, um, um, of David. When Saul, evil spirit came upon Saul, um, David had played the harp, you know. Now we would assume he might have sang some words or something like that, but that's when the evil spirit come upon him and Saul would be cool. And then he'd be cool long enough for David to get out of Dodge, you know what I mean? Because, he, it, you know, it's like, I, right, I'm cool for a moment, but now I got to revert back to what I do. You know, so... This is um, one of the things that we got to be careful. With. In other words, it's telling you to be discreet and use things in a, in, a, in a timely manner, all right? Sometimes singing is not appropriate for everybody. All right, continue. Verse 21, it reads, If thy enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou wilt yeah. keep coals of fire upon his head, and Jehovah will reward thee. All right, in other words, right in there, that's... 
That's not like when you say in the New Testament, love your enemies. We don't do that. All right? We don't love our enemies. We work on being humane with enemies. And this is what the Proverbs is telling you right here. And then say, love them. You know, you know, and we don't want to, because we don't live, talk about love in an abstract condition. We talk about conditioning a stage for love. You know, and that's what it's about. And so when people, you know, um, will say, you've been taught to, to love your brother and hate your enemies. Not only we don't have that in, uh, in, 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 in the law, the actual kumish itself, but even the Proverbs and the men of the great synagogue, that's, you know, 700 years before, you know, basically the new, new story come about, that he talk about what you need to do. So if the king and everybody else that's around him that compiled these Proverbs together that Solomon wrote that lived before him, then that was they meant in the sense that you're trying to defuse certain things. We don't have laws that if your enemy ox, you know what I mean? You know, go astray or ask go astray. We're supposed to return it, you know, back to him. Or if the ass that crops between burdens. Now, you know, the donkey could carry more than you could carry. So, but you got to help him with his weight. And it's an enemy. All right. So, we're trying to diffuse things. And that's what, the, um, that's what they're telling you how to diffuse um, action. And it said, the creator know that you're not trying to be his enemy, he's your enemy. And that's what the Proverbs telling you, that this is, he became your enemy, not you becoming his enemy. And that's why it tell you to do those things. All right, continue. Verse 23, it reads, The north one bringeth forth rain, and a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. All right, hold right there. There's another thing we got to think about, just for a half a moment. I'm going to try to speed this up a bit. Um, but a half a moment, let's look at this here. The north wind don't bring any rain. It used to do the opposite. You know, so, so looking for the rain from the north wind, that's not where, where it comes from. You know, and, and, and most geographics, they let you know that they'll normally come from up north, you know, and especially in that part of the world. You know, and it says, you know, in a backbiting tongue, an angry continence. All right. So, uh, so, so, so right then and there, <clears throat> you know, a backbiting tongue, you know, it's like, you know, you're putting your hopes in everything that's not, not, not that's based on um, um, uh, uh, fruitlessness. And that's what it's talking about. A backbiting tongue. You know, but continue. Verse 24. It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than in a house in common with a contentious woman. Yeah, they bring about women and everything. I mean, uh, I don't know why, but it seems like a lot of Proverbs are brittle with that. You know, but the thing is that whether it's a woman or, or somebody else in the household, you know, uh, you know, the thing is about peace. Shalom habayi. You know, that's what you always want to work on, the peace of a household. Because when you come home, that's supposed to be your sanctuary. If you can't find relaxation in a place where you rest your head, then where will you find it? You know, and that's where you're supposed to be investing in. But go ahead, 24 first. Verse 25, okay, okay. as cold waters to a faint soul, so is good news from a far, from a far country. Okay, right then and there. Uh, that means right there. You know, I mean, now we got, like I said, think about the, the people in the culture and the region they're in. All right. You know, um, now water too cold, you know, it's ain't healthy to drink it if you're really, really out of it. It's too cold. But we're talking about a cooling drink, you know, for people that's in a, a pastoral land of the people of that time. So a lot of times we read stuff and we don't see the um, we, we we lose the sight of who they talking to at the time, all right? And so, in other words, you know, a cool water is infant, you know, to the soul. So sometimes we got to realize also how we deal with uh, one another. You know, I mean, we, we got to you know make sure that we have the right soothing words, and not not some and not like soothing words as opposed to being sly and devious words. All right, continue twenty six. Verse 26, as a troubled fountain and a corrupted spring, so is a righteous man that giveth way before the wicked. Okay, in other words, you notice, it never said he's, he, he's not righteous still. He just let the wicked have his way. 
And that's what we got to look at. And they say he became wicked. He's still a righteous individual. But he said, why? Uh, look, uh, all right, you got that. You got that. I throw my hands up. I'm moving away. I'm moving away. And yet you find later on the prophet, a proverb said, the righteous bold is a lion. But one of the things that it's talking about is when the righteous individual just give way to the wicked guy and step to the side and let the wicked you know, pursue and do what, he, um, do what they do. That's what it's saying. So for wickedness to exist, there's a lot of uh, uh, good people to stand to the side and don't do anything. You know, so that's what it's saying here. And that's where you get that expression for, you know, for wickedness to exist. Um, continue. Verse 27. It is not good to, to eat much honey. So for men to search out their own glory is not glory. Okay, right. Then, yeah, yeah, don't blow your own horn. Much honey, some means it's the uh, it's the um it's the lack of a it's the lack of something that gives it value. You know, it talk about honey twice, you know what I mean, in this particular proverb. When something is in short supply, it becomes valuable. But when it's in a lot of something, then it loses its value, you know? So it's the rarity of it. And that's why, you know what I mean? It said for men to search out their own glory, you know, you know glory is, is, is not glory. That means right in there, because it got to be found and recognized in you, you know? It will emanate in you, you know, in itself. That means right then and there that you're trying to push everybody aside you know, to get your reputation out there. And a lot of people, you know, you meet plenty of people like that. The last verse. Last verse, verse 28. Like a city broken down and without a wall, so is he whose spirit is without restraint. Hallelujah. Look, all right. That means right in there, you got, you got to exercise um, self-control. You know, that's that's one of the things um, that, you know, we got we got to work on. You know, the, the thing on um, self-control. And, you know, and it's one of the things that's uh, really good, you know, I mean, uh, in character building, you know, I mean, we need to talk about, you know, self-restraint, you know, self-discipline, you know, I mean, you know, and, you know, and, 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 and keep it a modest, you know, keep it a modest profile. So those things that help you, you know, stay humble, you know, without transgressing on other people and recognizing the good qualities and all the people you come about. So I hope you got some of what I said. Any mistakes, you know, definitely, you know, it's my own. And, um, you know, with that, I would say Shalom Aleichem and early Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. Shalom Aleichem. Early Shabbat Shalom, um, Nasi. Um, praying that the Most High God will bless each and every one of you, that you have a, a beautiful Shabbat rest. And may the Most High God um, bless you. To see you another week, please join us next week. And I pray that the Most High God will bless us all. Hallelujah. Shalom, Shalom. Shalom, shalom, brothers and sisters. Get ready to experience the Unity Shabbat Kum, a celebration of praise and glory to the Most High Yah, hosted by Congregation Beit DCB. Join us on May 25th, 2024 at Shell's Loft, Brooklyn, located at 120 Hamilton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York, 11231. This event promises a day filled with spiritual upliftment, community unity, and joyful fellowship. Come together with fellow brothers and sisters to honor and worship as we celebrate the divine presence in our lives. For more information and to reserve your spot, contact us at 347-622-9090 or email us at info at baydcb.org. Don't miss this opportunity to connect, rejoice, and experience the power of unity and faith. Once again, brothers and sisters, experience the beauty of unity and faith at Unity Shabbat Kum. Presented by Congregation Bay DCB. Join us on May 25th, 2024 at Shell's Laws, Brooklyn. Located at 120 Hamilton Avenue, Brooklyn, New York. 11231. This special day is dedicated to praising the Most High Yah and coming together as a community and worship and celebration. Whether you're seeking spiritual enlightenment or simply looking to connect with like-minded individuals, this event offers an uplifting experience for all. Reserve your spot today by contacting us at 347-622-9090 or emailing us at info at baydcb.org. Let's gather in unity and embrace the spirit of togetherness as we honor the divine presence in our lives. Hallelujah. Shalom, shalom. 
Let's get knowledge, wisdom, understanding. We'll do our standing. All praises to the Most High, His laws and commandments. The hot cock Medina here to push it through your speakers. Judgment, truth, and love should be coming from the leaders. Yeah, knowledge, wisdom, understanding. We'll do our standing. All praises to the Most High, His laws and commandments. The hot cock Medina here to push it through your speakers. Judgment, truth.